Today I'm going to talk about John Green for some reason. Uh, what I'd like to know though, what I do at the museum is I always give a little tour. And before I give the tour, I want to know a little bit about you. So as far as I'm concerned, nobody's really asked you to work today. So I'm going to ask you to work so I can get an overview. How many people that are here, this is their first Bigfoot conference ever? Wow. How many people see themselves more into unknown things in general, more than Bigfoot? OK. How many people are really into cryptozoology in general? How many people are Bigfooters? How many people are Sasquatchers? Okay. <laughs> All right. What I'm going to talk about is John Green, very important man to me. I've known him since about 1962. Uh, didn't, I only got the meeting when I did a talk in um, Idaho, but I want to just go through these things quickly because I'm trying to get you all to supper. Let's see. Already Jeff talked about John Green looking like a science fiction person, you know. I want to mention that John Green was actually born on Lincoln's birthday, and I've always thought he looks a little bit like Lincoln which is pretty incredible, you know? He's a lot younger, but he has that same look. He also, as you know, was educated in universities, went to some big name university in the United States to get his master's in journalism and, you know, bought a newspaper and did all of those great things. What I'm mostly going to talk about today is not any specific sightings or any kind of specifics uh, with regard to Sasquatch. I'm going to talk about what I see as John Green has really influenced the whole field and the way we approach Sasquatch investigations. You haven't heard my talk yet. You might not be happy. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but what I really want to look at is, is really almost the cultural influence of this man. And as you're looking at some of these things, think about what if there was somebody else that had really written a book or written a bunch of books and steered us in a different direction? And really look at, in, in many ways, how John's influence has really fostered a whole kind of renewal of interest in this subject that was always really there behind the scenes. So we have this John Green business. I want to mention very quickly one of my mentors, which was Ivan T. Sanderson. I knew Ivan very, from the very first uh, time I got involved in cryptozoology in 1960. And uh, as opposed to Bernard Heuvelmans, who is credited with um, coining the name cryptozoology, even Heuvelmans acknowledges in his Sea Serpent book that it was actually Sanderson that came up with the name cryptozoology. What is cryptozoology? For those people that don't know, it's very quickly the study of unknown animals. Unknown animals by whom? By the scientist. Because the first peoples, the native peoples, the indigenous peoples, know these creatures are there. And it indeed is the people in the hood that knows what's going on. You know, it's the scientists that we have to wait for to verify. Very important. I'm not, you know, not disking them at all, but I'm saying that it's a real difference here. And cryptozoology is really the method by which we get from these stories to the acknowledgement of new species. It's obvious. We have new species discovered all the time. It really does happen. There's no mystery here. To me, it's a natural history subject. Uh, it belongs in academia. I taught in universities for 20 years. I brought it into all my courses in film and, and uh, anthropology and all of that. Didn't have much problem because I wasn't trying for tenure. <laughs> Uh, we've already mentioned this, but let me just point out something here. Uh, absolutely, it's true, Bigfoot is a made-up word, but Sasquatch is too. It's not a Native American, Native Canadian word. It's completely made up. So you have to look at these two words up here in Canada. You guys use Sasquatch a lot. And indeed, the early evidence is that the Sasquatch was really experienced like this separate tribal group. And then along came the work of DeHendon and Green that really changed this around. 
that's an important uh, way to start looking at. Gehenden is very important in this story, and I think that we need to give credit to, to the influence of Gehenden and the kind of partnership. John Green works very well be, with people. I know there's a lot of bad stories about that, maybe with a certain person whose name we're not allowed to say, but <laughs> he can say it, but we can't. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, uh, it's true that DeHendon and Green really were a dynamic duo, uh, you know, Robin and Batman almost working out there, and DeHendon we very much miss. And uh, I just wanted to say a moment, uh, you know, for him too. Here we have also Tom Slick. Now, Tom Slick, I did the book on Tom Slick. I did a couple books. I was the primary researcher to really bring him back uh, into the knowledge base because I saw him being this secretive figure. A lot of people don't really understand that one of the reasons we don't hear that much about Tom Slick is because his uncle was actually kidnapped by Machine Gun Kelly. And the family overall, psychologically, decided we're not going to be really out there in front of everything. And so uh, Slick very cautiously through Sanderson and through other people started putting money. Uh, I mean, he made mistakes. He made big mistakes with personalities. He did not make a mistake with John Green. He gave John Green, you know, some support. But of course, John Green was cutting his own trees and, and you know, digging cars out and stuff. So it wasn't all hunky-dory like a certain person sitting over in a, a hotel in India who was getting funded. Uh, John Green did a lot of uh, hard work. So you can read all of these sometimes, and you can look at my books. The other thing is, uh, behind all of this, you've got to put yourself in the mind frame of 1950s. In 1950s, uh, it was only a few years since the di first discovery of the first live giant panda. So the framework was that Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti were going to be discovered any day. So there was a whole different framework of thinking about this, of thinking it was just around the corner. Uh, the mountain gorilla had only been discovered in 1902. And the whole emphasis was that we were just really going into an era of discovering new animals, and Bigfoot Sasquatch was going to be discovered. But the other important part of it is it took a long time to find the first live giant panda and the first mountain gorilla. So if you look at 1958 for the Bigfoot, kind of the modern era of Bigfoot, we're only really in the same time frame as when they first found the first mountain gorilla. So patience is very much a vir virtue in this field. We have to really be calm about it and think we're in this for the long haul. And some of us get to be around longer than others, and that's great. Uh, so you know that's, that's part of it. We have to remember the history. The history is very important in all of this. Wait, let's see if I can do this. One of the other things is the whole place of the abominable snowman in this. 1921 is really the beginning of the modern era of the snowman, of the Yeti. And so the word Sasquatch, of course, didn't come in until 1929. But in North America, especially in the United States, it still was a regional thing, Sasquatch. So the word, you know, the abominable snowman was very important. So Patterson's book, of course, came out, and it had that title on it. It wasn't about Sasquatch. It wasn't about Bigfoot. The whole framework was that this creature was some kind of yeti that was over in the United States and or in Canada. The other thing is all of these early drawings show us that the yeti was really brown and very much a creature that looks somewhat, not the feet and not a lot of behaviors, but somewhat like a Bigfoot. Uh, what I know from my research is that Yetis are not white. There's not one of them. They don't live in the mountaintops. That is mostly due to one movie that brainwashed us, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Uh. <laughs> By the way, bumbles do not bounce. <laughs> then, of course, 1958 comes. We have the Bluff Creek uh, situation going on. Uh, I'm very much in the camp that this was not a Wallace hoax, that the Wallace uh, print does not match the Bluff Creek, despite rumors that say differently. I'm not in that camp. I very much think that there are some Wallace problems, but a lot of those footprints have nothing to do with Wallace. Green is more than a chronicler. What I mean by that, if you read in a lot of books, people talk about John 
just writing books and just being a chronicler. Now what I'm going to talk about is how he's more than that. The books are very influential and very important. One of the reasons I started writing books was to share my experiences, not because I wanted to be a writer or I wanted to be on TV. I wanted to share what was going on. Well, John was already a journalist. He connected to a newspaper, so he got a little passionate about this, got excited about it, started writing about it. But what I want to point out in these next few slides is that John actually influenced the field way beyond just writing about it. He did things that really set up certain situations. One is eyewitness interviews. Uh, journalistic background, you don't make up things in your office. You know, you go out in the field, you interview people, uh, you do it forensically, journalistically. He did that kind of uh, information gathering. I mean, it may be different in the age of the internet and blogging, but John did that old fashioned shoe leather kind of interviewing that was very important and it transfers very well to Bigfoot investigations. You don't just listen to stories or gather a whole bunch of newspaper articles or listen to other people, you go and talk to primary sources and that's what he did that was very important. He also collected eyewitness drawings. I want you to know, this is from Binder Nagel's book and I like John a lot, and, and it's, this is a great example to actually show you who was there first. The oldest drawing here is a John Green drawing. John Green was doing some of these initial eyewitness interviews, getting drawings and different things like that at the beginning. And because he was doing this, other people have followed in, in his uh, footprints around this. No pun intended, by the way. Um, he also was interested in uh, I mean, I was kind of upset to hear that Harrison Hot Springs is going to do a, a Bigfoot statue and it's going to be a male, when in fact Patty is female, but you know, that's just an aside. Uh, John was not afraid to get the reports as they were being talked about. Uh, there were female Bigfoot seen uh, from the very beginning. Uh, there's a gender diversity. Uh, obviously, if there's one Bigfoot, there's more than one Bigfoot out there, there's family groups, there's breeding, there's population, you know, all of that going on. John very early on started getting all kinds of reports without any kind of prudish uh, Bible Belt kind of influence, which you often see in some of the American reports where people are not reporting these details. They're getting them, and uh, I know I'm infamous for my chapter Sex and the Single Sasquatch in my Bigfoot book, but it has to be talked about. If we're talking about animals, we need to talk about these as uh, you know, breeding populations. So, uh, also field work. Field work was very important in the early stages for John, and I think many of us reading about this, thinking about it, didn't just clip articles. We went out in the field. Uh, it, it's very interesting being uh, a person like myself that's been in the field for so long some of these younger internet kids come along and they say, well, that Lauren, he writes a lot of books, but it's too bad he never does field work. Well, I'm getting too old to do so much field work, but I did a lot of field work. I followed John's example. I listened to him. Uh, you know, I read the books. I saw what was going on and, and the way to do it, and that's what a lot of us are doing. If we would have read some other kind of book from somebody else, we might have gone a different direction, and, and John's very important with regard to this. Track investigations. Very early on, Bob Titmus's influence uh, on John and John being right there gathering footprints, I think really set up a situation where this was an important piece of physical evidence that we needed to gather. And so what did that influence? I think it influenced Krantz, more than Krantz gave it credit for. And Jeff is you know, man enough to stand up here and say that you know, he was influenced by Green. And I think that's uh, for academics, to be influenced by amateurs is just part of what happens. And, uh, and also, Jeff's pretty smart. He knows that all of us are gonna get tracks and he wants them all. You know, he wants copies of them because that helps the data and it helps the research. Now, I'm gonna, I just threw this in. I wanna respond to one thing that Jeff said that uh, hopefully will help him understand something that history is important and I want uh, just to answer to this. Ray actually, asked, we have letters, early letters verifying this, Ray asked Grant Mullins to make 
some of these wooden fakes for him. And what we have here is a train. This one in the middle that wasn't shown this morning is actually from some of the nephews of Ray Wallace that were brought out at the same time as the famous ones we see here. And what we've got going on here is that actually Ray Wallace was experimenting with some of his fakes. And so he would go to Rant, who had this block sort of situation, and then they, you can see a progression there. Now, I definitely agree with uh, Jeff that not all of these are fakes. I think there's some contamination in the database, uh, but it's not enough to you know, get sidetracked. But I think it helps us with the debunkers and the skeptics to, when we find bad data, to throw it out, to acknowledge it, and then to move on. How about the, the Patterson-Gimlin film? Of course John was there right from the beginning and was there, you know, went down there, did all of these. But let's think about what he did that we see still going on. John was actually involved in, you know, if you think about it, he was involved in one of the earliest film analyses of the Patterson-Gimlin film with Jim McLaren. And I wanna, I've been saving this up to announce it here, but it looks like I've rediscovered the original tape of this, the original film strip of this, because when Jim McLaren got out of the field in 1975, he gave me a couple, three, four boxes of material, and I've been going through it for years, and I found this strip of tape, and I'm working with uh, a film guy in uh, Maryland, and we may have the original tape of this uh, analytical film. So uh, this, this film's very important. John did that work. Uh, you know, Jim McLaren's a, a very tall man, and that was a good scale. So uh, that kind of stuff that John did is now, of course, what people do on YouTube all the time. So, and not to blame John for that, but film analysis was important. It's kind of gone off the rail a bit, but it's still an important method. And of course, we have Jeff being involved in film analysis too. Uh, this is the playmate that he was referring to this morning. The play this is her, it's really the woman. I decided to use one with clothes on because I didn't know who was here. Um, and I, you know, there might be Mounties in the audience. But anyway, this is the Bigfoot that uh, supposedly had their erection and was filmed in front of the, um, the van that this woman was in. And now it's called the Redwoods film. I think that film analysis has been pretty, uh, pretty important in the field, and uh, you know I, I look forward to having more films like that, more videos that really we can look at. And I think if you look at where John was in those early days, as opposed to just taking it and you know believing it or writing about, it, he actually was went back to the site and tried to recreate some things. Okay, the other thing that I want to mention that I think it's important to acknowledge is that John really helped us suffer the clowns in the field and the actors. Uh, Ivan Marks, uh, Ray Wallace, and some other guy. Um, and I think it's important to really know that there are some people in the field that really can stir up trouble or uh, cause you know, certain deceptions to go on. And that really set us up to, to understand that later on, whenever we got into this, uh, we can understand that it's really the heritage still continues on in this field. Uh, and a lot of people don't know that Tom Biscardi was actually, his mentor was Ivan Marks. And he still works with Ivan Marks' uh, sons and relatives. So uh, it doesn't, the, the apple, the rotten apples don't fall far from the trees. As uh, has been mentioned already today, John Green was right there early on. I've talked to Jim McLaren many times and John, you know, in the back, back in the old days, how they used these index cards, and uh, you know, I've even got some of the copies of the old index cards that Jim McLaren. That was before computers. Uh, John, Jim McLaren also used little IBM cards, and they tried to, you know, use the early computer systems. It's just they didn't have enough data, and they needed more answers. But if you read his book, John Green is actually using some of that data and marching right through it with you uh, in an analytical analysis that really pre is a precursor to the way many of us think and use the internet with this data. And the data analysis still continues. They bring in John for you know, his comments on the cast and other things like that. 
then the book, you know, Sasquatch came along in 1978, compiles a lot of this data, and made, makes a major impact across the world. And that's sort of the sub-theme uh, of my talk here is that indeed, John Green didn't just influence Canada. He very much influenced the whole world of looking at the way we analyze and look at Sasquatch and Bigfoot. Uh, the whole concept that Bigfoot is an ape really, I think, issues from John Green. Uh, Jeff has certainly continued down that road. Uh, my, the subtitle of my book, Bigfoot, is the true story of apes in America. Uh, that's, that's actually a, a younger version of Jeff, I think, in the picture. Um, you know, and he, he's always talked about apes. John Bendenego has too. And this is the underlying theme. Also, uh, another important thing that John did, he didn't just stay in Canada. He actually went across the country and started talking about how some of these reports were very important in the East. And I, I know there's a, there used to be kind of this battle between the East and the West, and, and I was actually excluded from coming to Willow Creek by some Chamber of Commerce committee because I was from the East. Um, thank goodness I'm here you know, for this one. But uh, Momo is a case in which it's, you had uh, a strange creature that you couldn't see its eyes and reports over and over again. It was always bipedal. It wasn't one of these ape-like creatures that you actually hear about from the south, which are the swamp apes. But John gathered that, put it in his Sasquatch book, and really gave a lot of us hope that somebody would listen to us too. Because, I mean, one of the things is that we don't want to be excluded from this field too, just because there's all this information from Northern California to British Columbia doesn't mean, mean that some of the other stories shouldn't be investigated too. Uh, I'm not saying there's a lot of data for that, and a, a certainly a sighting is not proof of a creature, not proof of a new species. Uh, we certainly know that from the East. It could be a cultural phenomenon, but it's important to study. Uh, same thing with the, the skunk ape reports. And this is the Mayaka photograph. Is it an orangutan-like creature? Is it a costume? Uh, is it, uh, we don't know what it is. It's, it was an elderly lady that kept having her apples being raided from her porch. And she goes out with a little Instamatic camera and clicks off a couple photographs. And you still don't know what this is. And she absolutely hid her identity because she didn't want to be bothered. Um, but it's, it's one of those cases that because of John Green's influence, we were able to uh, you know, really stay focused in this field. The other thing that I didn't put a slide in here, but I do want to mention, is John, when I, in my first correspondence, I was an anthropology student. And I, uh, he, he hooked me up with a, a Mark A. Hall in, in Minnesota, who was also an anthropology student. And John suggested that since there was this kind of gap in the record, why didn't some of us younger anthropology students look in the direction of Native American traditions and folklore and look into that? And, and we, Mark and I actually published an article on, on part Eastern Band Cherokee. So I was already aligned to doing some of that, and it became a very important focus uh, of my later anthropology years. And so John, I think, would do this. He was saying to me, you know, you're about the same age as my oldest son and all of that. I was a little older. But he had this kindness in him and his responsiveness to young, interested, passionate uh, individuals that really propelled us on. Uh, also, John was on TV. A lot of us understood that that was an important uh, area that we needed to really be polished about, be very interested in, in projecting out there. He came across down to earth, honest, uh, very knowledgeable, and that really set many of us up looking in that direction and doing something similar to what John was doing. Um, um, many of us that you see speaking here have been interviewed in reality programs. And uh, of course, some of them are ones that kind of, we always know the endings of, but at least, you know. And the other thing is, in the days of the mountain gorilla and the giant panda, the funding was coming from zoos and museums. Unfortunately, today, some of us live paycheck to paycheck from documentary film companies that don't want to give us any money, and we have to keep 
telling them our time costs a little bit of money. And that's how we get research funds sometimes, uh, believe it or not. Documentary films, uh, reality TV are the main funder of Bigfoot research. That's an unfortunate reality of what we're, what's happening today. It would be nice if the Tom Slicks of the world were still out there, but they don't seem to be right now. People impact. John has touched the lives of many researchers and influenced them. I just put a, a few pictures of people. Uh, I also mentioned in the little write-up that I put in the tribute book that it used to be the thing that people would go to Willow Creek and they'd stand next to a statue and they'd always want to get their picture taken next to that statue. Well, the whole thing to nowadays is to stand next to Bob Gimlin or John Green and get your picture taken. So it's kind of progressed to a different place. Uh, John's influenced me tremendously. I, I've written 35 books, and many of them are based upon me being even more radical than John, because I was really influenced to be really on the edge of uh, you know writing a book about the creatures that may be taller than Bigfoot, which we call true giants, or looking at the whole fact that all of the creatures around the world that the media want to call Bigfoot are different possible species, and, and trying to really always push the envelope to ask the questions that even cryptozoologists and Bigfooters. Nobody, when I started talking about sex in the single Sasquatch, really wanted to hear that talk. Well, maybe a few people did, but, um, <laughs> but it, it's really been a, kind of interesting. International influence. John has you know, very much been in touch with the Russians, went to Moscow to the conference over there. And this is Paul Crawford from Australia. So even the people looking into the Yowies are visiting John and getting his influence and information. Uh, the People Impact continues. Uh, this group here, it would be great to have us all stand on the steps and take a big picture with John in the middle because he's really influenced uh, an incredible amount of people. The future, I think the future has already really been scripted by John. Uh, for all of these years, he's written his books and we have been following a design of intensive field investigations, looking and gathering tracks, sending it to the right people like Jeff, uh, looking uh, at the reality of these things, not being too crazy. I think that if you look at, and I've done this sort of histories of, uh, looking at the histories of ufology and the ghosts and all of that, uh, there's a much more groundedness in the Bigfoot field. I know I'm very biased, but it's true. There's not that many uh, wackos in our field, thank goodness. Uh, I mean, if anybody has an exception to that, let me know later. Um, so we're onward. we got to keep going. Uh, it's been fun to be here, and I hope I kept it short enough so we can have supper tonight. Uh, take care. Thank you.